John. Good to meet you, man. Good to meet you, brother. I, um, I wanted to travel down here because I hear that uh, you got uh, quite a project going here. You've been uh, working, what, tirelessly for a couple of years, challenging the law as it is, getting arrested a lot, huh? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, uh, I think the big thing I learned over the past two years was it's a crime to sleep in the city of Tucson. It's a crime to go to the bathroom at certain times in the city of Tucson. And it's a crime to peaceably assemble any time of day on, on public land. So those were, the past two years, those were really my mission to try to address those in some way. Because it didn't only affect the homeless community, but it affected people that really honestly wanted to address their grievances with the government and put together some solutions to address those problems that are going on. Definitely, definitely. Well, what, 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 can you elaborate on um, it's a crime to express yourself in the public? Well, it's a crime to peacefully assemble. Pretty much uh, all around the city of Tucson, whether it's a park or at certain sidewalks or certain plazas, they're closed at a certain time. So if you decide, hey, I wanna, I'm going to sit right here and with my group of friends, and we're going to discuss whatever we have to discuss to find a solution for whatever that problem is, you don't get that right. You don't. You can be in the park during the hours of 7 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. You better have a solution within that time span because you got to be out of there by that time. And that, what seems to be a simple principle of just the commons and people to be able to gather and, and create solutions around them, we don't have that right any longer. So it's kind of like they're suppressing the freedom with regulations on time. They're regulating anything they possibly can, and it seems like at this point they've regulated a lot of what would be our core First Amendment rights, such as, like I mentioned, sleeping, going to the bathroom, or just meeting with a group of friends to discuss whatever problems you may have in your life. Well, those other issues that you brought up, that, that uh, really embodies, you know, being homeless, you know, because obviously if you got a home or someplace, you... you you might not choose to sleep out in the park, but there's always going to be homeless, yeah. obviously, yeah. obviously. One thing, you've been working with the homeless for how long now? Oh, well, just ever since the Occupy began two years ago. Well, so been, for about two yeah, years? I was an environmental activist for the past ten years, and still in, but for the past two years, definitely homeless activism has been my, my torch. And you've been on the actual ground level, you've been sleeping with the homeless. You're, you're actually homeless yourself, yeah. by choice, right? By choice. Yeah, there's there most of the uh, the people I meet day to day. That's not the case. They're it's usually circumstantial. Whether they're SMI, they have substance abuse, or just you know have mental illness issues in some capacity where they can't go to a regular job and they go to jail all the time because of it, both for one thing or the other. And um, just once I got involved in the Occupy movement, which the Occupy movement is just about calling out corruption and calling out corporate greed and injustices around us, this is the base floor. This is the foundation of, of the people that are being oppressed by those that are oppressing us. And I felt just since I was amongst it, this was where I would start to start creating some solutions, some alternatives to what we've known before so that way those who aren't getting help or those who are considered to be at the bottom of the, of the pyramid have the same support and have the same chances that, that the people at the top of the pyramid would. And I think a lot of the people out here, I mean, granted, begging is some part of this culture in a way, but they're not looking for a handout. They're sure. just looking for freedom. They're just looking sure. to be able to choose whatever choices they make as long as they're not harming anybody, just be allowed to do it. Yeah, well, and, and if you do need help, you know, you should ask somebody. Well, there's services available for everybody else when they're in a tough spot. Those same services should be available to the homeless without being blocked by having an address or being blocked by having a phone or being blocked by having transportation. There's just, there's all these hurdles in the way for homeless people left and right that pretty much make it so they will be criminals by the end of the month. They will be criminals by the end of the six month period at the minimum because that's the way it's been set up for them. Well, is there a legal, honest way for someone who's homeless to actually generate any source of income? I mean, I know when I moved, 
here in the Tucson, they used to allow people, if they wanted to risk their, their life and go out in the medians and sell papers, you know, for, for peanuts, basically, but it was generating some kind of income. Is there any th any kind of legal free market way that they can generate well, there's, income? There's different programs we've tried to put in place here oh, to not just make money because I know the, the, the underlying principle in our society is at least you're making something. You know, at least you got a job. But most of the people that live on these streets, we don't live by that principle. Right? We're not. We don't want to get be overworked and underpaid. A lot of the people have found themselves here because they refuse to be underworked. So the programs that we put in place are programs like going around, collecting the recycling as a team, crushing it as a team, turning that in as a team, and it's still, it's in some respects, peanuts, maybe a little bit more than newspaper, but sure. peanuts. And another thing we're doing is, as a group, we place different Craigslist ads for different trades and get, find each other work. Like, for example, last Wednesday, six of us went and moved somebody from uh, North Tucson to Oro Valley. So it's, and you're doing that through Craigslist as a, right. a co-op. Yeah. You, you cooperate to kind of help get get some kind of um, honest work out mm -hmm. there. Exactly. If, if people are willing, I assume. And, that's, and that's really what it's it's all about. Is I mean, it's there's a, a big uh, stereotype, a big stig stigma that that hovers over the homeless population. But these people are your neighbors. These people were probably went to school with you. These people are people. So yeah. All they really need, all they, all, any of these guys out here really want is just a chance. And it's, but it's up to us you know, as, a, as a group, as those citizens, to put together that infrastructure to make it so people are willing to give people a chance and that, that stigma can kind of be eroded down a little bit and people can start seeing they're just people. Sure. Well, that's, that's the thing that really uh, amazes me about you because you're combating me. You know, I know you, you've been very vocal on um, in, in combating these issues where it seems like our lawmakers aren't. You know, that's Any what other things that, that you're able to work with or do you feel maybe the system in itself is so restricted in that? Well, it's just the, the, out here the, you don't need much money. Right. Unless you have a tobacco habit or some other type of vice that's outside of food and water and the basic needs that you need to survive, you don't need money at all. I know people like um, here, a guy named Daniel, he hasn't made money for the past two years. Doesn't have any hustle at all, doesn't beg, doesn't do it, doesn't, hasn't had money at all. And in some regard, you know, that, that does exist. And there are people that really don't have any interest in making money. Sure. But for those people who who do, I think we're gonna continuously try to to integrate little programs that can do that. I mean it's we've been thirty five days that we've been doing this now, so it's it's certainly a slow coming, but that's the making money part isn't as big as the helping people part. Right. A lot of what, what we do here is for example, you have a, a guy who has his GED and he doesn't have really any criminal record, has fairly good credit. You know, I, we'll walk him over to Pima Community College, get him registered there, get some fast on a student loan. The guy gets $3,500 in his first week of school and probably has more money than he's ever had in his life. Like, that's why this is here. So just to help people find a way out, to help people find what the next step is, because most that's where most of us are stuck. Most of us don't know the, the process of the system. We don't know where where we should go to get to the next step. We're just stuck right here at this step, and we're just happy that we're alive. Right. Yeah. Definitely. But you're trying to build a camp now. Are you able to sleep here on the grass, no, or do you still, still have to do the sidewalk? Yeah. So you have to sleep on. Is there some some at some point? You want to try to get it to where they'll let you pitch a tent in the grass? Possibly. What I think that's waiting more on, I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but I filed a federal lawsuit two years ago against the city of Tucson because we asked, on that sign right there, it says, no camping in the park without special written permit. So we asked for a special written permit in writing, and they denied it. We 
filled out the appeal with some type of compromise and they denied it. So we just, we took it to federal court and let federal court decide. Who gets special permits? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, they got a sign. Yeah, they say, it says, 21-373 clearly says that you may camp in the park. So, but you can't find anyone who actually has utilized yeah. that. I'm gonna or a process that. in the books that talks about who gets and doesn't get to use it, what the cost involved with it is, and what nothing about the process at all. The only thing you'll see about that is 21-373. And and I assume you've probably tried to research it, huh? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the law was um, put in place in 1973. It was ratified, or um, it was amended in 1984, and it's really been an ineffective law other than the fact that it prevents people from setting up a tent. Oh, so even though it says no, no camping unless you get a permit, they use that to say you can't camp there, basically. At all, yeah. So then they won't give you reasons why they denied it? Um, a lot of the reasoning that they used were Occupy Tucson's track record. Like they pretty much, they tried to say that if they were to allow us to have a camp, the problems that they had with Occupy Tucson would be the same problems they would have with our camp. Okay. Even though the fallacy in that is Occupy Tucson wasn't a permitted event. Occupy Tucson couldn't say who had permission to be there or not be there. If we had any problems with anybody, we had to deal with it. It was a matter of civil disobedience. You were doing it to, to prove a point. Yeah. And it, and, but the thing is, there's un, it was unregulatable. Like, there's nothing we could do when we had problems. If somebody punched somebody else in the face, we couldn't do anything. If somebody was doing drugs or drinking, we couldn't do anything. Well, isn't that what they do, though? They take a group of people, and they take the problem makers, and then they try to label the whole group as yeah. the problem makers. But if we had a permit to a permit in the park, and we had permission to say who could and could not be there, if someone's drinking, you can't be here. If somebody's getting a fight with people, you can't be here. And that's how that's how you address those problems. On, on the public space, like, even though I, I almost, I'm almost glad that they did it that way, because it really showed us tools and methods of how to deal with some of the issues that happen day to day on the streets in a nonviolent way and actually be able to regulate it and be able to have some order and have some organization to it. Like everybody you see at this park is connected in this community and there's probably dozens if not hundreds of fights that may have broken out every day downtown that aren't because we're speaking with people and making them think first about ways to deal with things non-violently before they deal with it violently. And granted, there are, there's still violence. Oh, there's sure. There's a lot of violence. People are violent. But <laughs> there's different methods and principles that resonate within the Occupy that if we get an opportunity to spread those principles and, and theories, it's going to be a lot more peaceful, at least. So it's a non-aggression principle, and you're also doing self-regulation. Yeah which is happening day to day anyways. It's just most of the people that are doing it don't have the necessary tools to do it in a non-violent way. Okay. So that way you don't have to use the resource of the police yeah. over silly squabbles exactly. and fights. Exactly. And we've been here for 35 days. This is this was a very, I wouldn't say very high crime, but this was a high crime park. But for 35 days we've had zero reports of incidents. Excellent, excellent. And, and then I also noticed uh, you posted a picture today of you doing the watch. So you actually have a watch going yeah. like they do in the military yeah. to make sure everyone's safe. And yeah, most of the time I'm, uh, I do most of the watch during the day and um, actually I'd say myself or two other people but I like to be here most of the day and then I'll, uh, I'll go to bed around 11 or 12 right there on the sidewalk and um, it's usually when my watch ends and then we have a guy named Ken Lee who comes here every evening and he watches over all night long to about four or five o'clock in the morning just to make sure that everybody gets that safe peaceful sleep that we promise yeah that's must be it must be hard to sleep out here with the lights and all yeah you get into a sleeping bag get a couple of blankets cover your head <laughs> you're you cool where you're at yeah well that's cool yeah i like it a lot i mean of all the granted i know a lot of people call me an old hippie or or whatever and, but i i like being outside, I like being, feeling the, the weather change, I, 
I like the idea that I don't have any random utilities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that freedom I was talking about that most people probably can't even understand. No, you really you can't, but we, it's, it's just, definitely about, it's not for everybody. I mean, no. But that's, that's the point. Yeah. It's, it's really, well, it's just not for anybody. Right. You know, it's the people, everybody, if anybody has a building, everybody should have a building. And if, I mean, if, why isn't everybody homesteading? I mean, there's, there's all these things that are afforded to certain people that should be afforded to everybody. Give it no. Nobody should be given anything. But they should have, have the ability to, to have it just like anybody else. And all we can do is take these little steps to start working toward this. And to me, this is a big deal. Because I've been arrested for this 36 times, whether it was here or there, just for what we're do we've been doing for 35 minutes. Just to figure out how to be homeless legitimately. Yeah. Definitely. Without any problems with... And working with the government. I mean, that's the big thing. That The big difference between the past 35 days and the past two years. Is the past two years, I did everything I could to get under the government's skin, to push them, to get chest to chest with them, and to let them know that they, if they stand in my way, that they're my enemy. So but you just made a change. Completely. Personally. Yeah. Well, it's just, once... They gained my trust, or I gained their trust, and they saw I was for real, and I wasn't kidding, I wasn't just someone else that was saying, hey, if you do that, I'm going to sue you, and I gained their trust when we sat down and they said, okay, this is allowed, this isn't allowed. If you keep it that way, we'll keep it that way. And they followed up on it for the past 35 days. And I can't ask any more from them, and especially if they're, when... If we have any problems, I feel like, as my government should be, they're there as a support to us. But we, at this point, haven't needed. Well, you, uh, it, it seems like to me you're trying the best you can to be independent. Yeah. You know, and not have to depend on things. Well, that's that's kind of the point of this whole thing. At least for this camp, I mean, I really, we're just trying to set a model for a sustainable 24-hour safe sleeping place that hopefully we can impl implement in other places around town, or maybe even other cities in the United States. And if we're always having to find money or find resources to make it happen, then that's not sustainable. It's not going to be really easy to keep going in place to place. Where if it takes care of itself, the principles take help people organize themselves, then it's, it's feasible. Sure. And especially in, it's feasible in the eyes of the lawmakers, because all, all they really care about is the money. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you planted the seed. You definitely planted the seed. Where do you think, what do, what do you expect it to grow into? That's a million dollar question. Yeah? That's a million dollar question. I mean, going, in, going into this campaign, my unequivocal and pretty much only goal was to have a safe place for people to sleep 24 hours a day. To make it so that people weren't getting tickets, people weren't getting taken to jail just for trying to have a safe place to sleep. And, and we got that. We won. We won that part. But now at this point, it's. I want to think it's. It's kind of where the community leans in, and and they fill in the gap where where they think there is a problem or where they see that this can actually be a mechanism for them to have their voices heard or to have their issues address because I think the one thing if nothing that Occupy Public Land has shown the community is once we see a problem and we put together a plan of action we're going to fix that problem. Yeah definitely. Well I, I can respect that. As far as steps and maybe a, so so what if there's an abandoned property that maybe you can, can do as an encampment you know make it to where the city isn't because they care about the money part of it. Mm -hmm they can't have the liability of it and, but it also has to be maintained to a certain you know i'm sure certain standard yeah well what we're looking into right now this is actually an idea just came up i met with uh president of tucson arts for game michael schwartz came up today and he um and we're discussing purchasing city land because the city has four thousand parcels of land that they trade and they sell some some of it they sell for as little as one dollar because it's just a burden to the city to own it so we're going to be looking into that, seeing if we can buy, buy a piece of parcel of land, preferably, in, obviously, it would have to be an industrial zone, turn it into a campsite. 
and make for 24-hour bathrooms, make for 24-hour showers, maybe have little huts on the property that, that people can stay in temporarily or permanently. But one big thing a lot of us homeless service advocates, including the churches and, and some of Primavera, La Frontera people, we're trying to create a multi-stage program that can take somebody from day one and work them toward complete independence for themselves. And it seems like, this, it, assuming it's, let's just say it's a four-stage program, this is stage one, this is intake, this is where the first place that any, any homeless person is going to touch when they need help. The second stage would be a parcel of land with a campsite, so, you know, if you, you've worked whatever steps you needed to get to the next stage, you'd be able to stay there, have a little bit more independence, have a place to keep your stuff, have a little bit more um, isolation from you know, completely open. Stage three, possibly being working in Primavera or La Frontera, where you have a shelter program, you have, maybe have your own room, and you have a place to a locker to keep your stuff and you're really starting to move that, that stuff on the stage and then from there there's several different house, housing placement programs that exist that you know with a little bit of support from the community a little bit of support from the community services it can actually be a feasible option for those coming off of the third stage to actually get back into mainstream life and, and, and pursue that if that's what they're looking for so that's on the back burner of sorts, that's what's going on around the city of Tucson is trying to create a coalition of these people who really do care about the homeless and are putting their ass on the line for the homeless to bind together and figure out what these four stages are and what mechanisms we need in place to fulfill those four stages. Okay. Well, that sounds pretty... It sounds like I, I understand it's only at a brainstorming yeah. stage, but it sounds reasonable to me. No, I, I think people who know me or follow me or really have got the opportunity to, to see who I am, they know I'm, I'm a pragmatic guy, like I'm not much of a radical. But I, would def, I call myself a moderate of sorts, even though some call me liberal, because I try to look for solutions that are logical. I'm not really idealistic. I'm not optimistic or pessimistic, I'm, I just want something that, whether you're on the right side of the aisle or the left side of the aisle, we can both look at that and say, okay, that is a problem, that's a plan, and I, I'm okay with working for it. Like, I don't, I don't have anything ideolo ideological that says I wouldn't be able to do that. Which with, you know, the Occupy camps, in a lot of ways, that did have sticking points for a lot of different groups, because in a lot of ways, it was just a um, stop in your fit, stop in your feet, pinching a fit, holding your breath type tactic that isn't the way we communicate as individuals. If I have a problem with you or you have a problem with me, we sit down, we talk about it, we come to some type of compromise so that way we can both continue to move forward. It's not, hey, I have a problem with you and I'm going to hold my breath until you do yeah. what I tell you to do. Well, if you're going to do that, I'm yeah. going to throw a temper yeah. tantrum and, <laughs> and kick my meat on yeah. the floor and throw myself on yeah, it and exactly. cry and say, you're wrong! <laughs> yeah, that doesn't get anywhere doesn't get in the long run. Yeah. And I'm, 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 I, I think it's, I think it's very, um, there's a lot of insight on how, you know, how you came about that conclusion but it's also uh, something that I can respect you for because you're saying okay I did it this way for so long and I didn't get the result I was looking for so let's try something different and it seems like what you've tried different is working out better for you. It's so great I mean some of these same people got arrested with me in front of the exact court right there a year ago for this exact same thing. So, I, I've been saying a lot, the proof is in the pudding. And it definitely seems like pudding is the appropriate flavor right now. And it sounds like you made your enemy your friend. Yeah. Yeah, and from a lot of my, my friends that, that are friends with government officials say that they have a lot of respect for what we're doing, and they're building more and more respect for our group by the day, so... That's good. It counts for something. I mean, that's definitely, I'm, 
I'm under the, the rule of thought that we have to create the solutions outside of the government because they're, they have their hands tied in a lot of ways. But, oh, more ways than we can even conceive. But I definitely, it's a lot easier working without their resistance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. What's your thoughts on a public garden? Like maybe maintaining um, an urban garden? Yeah, well, we, it's been an idea we've had here. The, the background on gar community gardens around Tucson is they're usually lorded over, and the community doesn't really get access to them. But what we've been thinking about here, and it's not, we can't do a permanent garden in the park, but we can do a, a flower bed garden. So we've been thinking about bringing out pots or bringing out flower beds to the park during the day and doing our gardening, and then taking it into our storage facility at night to so that we don't get in trouble for shoving the sidewalk or, or keeping it in the park. And we and down the line I definitely I think if we show that we're trustworthy and that we can we can keep things in order, they might let us keep it in the park during the day. Or even on the property that you guys got yeah. the got on that would but I would hope that this we get the flower beds and the garden going here a little bit sooner than when we have that property because it probably the soonest that we'd be looking at having any property would be a year to year and a half is the process of getting land from the city. Sure. But sure. this the starting a garden out here has been something we've been thinking about doing probably within the next month and you know inviting people to come out, inviting people to bring stuff to you know just start teaching people the, the process of gardening, which is such a simple process but most people really have never learned it yeah well it's still a lot of work still a lot of work but it's worth it but when you're out here and you're just hanging out not really doing anything else it's not gonna hurt you to go over there spend 30 minutes over no uh, i think it would right feel now. good yeah i, I imagine it. i imagine it's things like that and things like integrating arts out here like a big big idea i've been having lately is put out a whole bunch of sheets white sheets out on the on the grass with posts to hold them down and tell people to go do whatever art whether you want to spray paint or you want to paint whatever you want to do maybe we do that every day or maybe every wednesday people come out here and those who would usually go and graffiti a wall or usually go and try to have their voices heard in a possibly illegal way can can use that to to have their voices heard and maybe we'll will hang the sheet out, out there on the trees during the day during certain days and it gives them a way to express themselves exactly and it's it's things like that creativity and innovation that will be the saving grace of this community as a whole. Oh, uh, not just the homeless so. community, but the, the house community as well. Because, I mean, <clears throat> you go out and you, you paint or you, you take pictures or even do this, and just how much does creative juices start flowing and the innovation start flowing and, and things not even connected to this at all start flourishing and growing because you were involved in that. Right. And those. Those are the simple principles that we know, but we're being propagated to think that we need to start focusing on math and science, and arts aren't really that important. And it's up to us to ensure that we don't completely get programmed by that type of that rule of thought. Well, I think yeah. so. Yeah, well, and that's what, I mean, it's, it's just what life's all about. You kind of choose what you think your time is worth and where you should be spending your time, and you do it. And I would, for me, it was... For at least for this time, it's homeless rights. You know, it's right. I found a niche that I'm great at, that I love, and a need that absolutely needed to be filled, and I'm filling it. Well, that that's why I'm here, because uh, I I find that it, it's not just homeless rights; it's human rights. Mm -hmm. You know, I would consider you uh, as much of a human rights activist than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. more special because you're dealing with the subject that most people don't want to talk about, that most people don't even want to address. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is no easy solution. There is no. <laughs> it's not just one solution. Because one, there's so many different type of people. So there's so many different type of homeless people. So where you have, you have one per homeless person who wants to be homeless for the rest of his life. And you have another homeless person who wants to get a job and get back on his feet and get married and live in a white pick live in a house with a white picket fence. So it's a matter of putting putting all these solutions in front of them, putting get all these choices in front of them and making at least one of them feasible for them to choose so they can move on to the next step where they're gonna put all these choices in front of them. And that's that's how solutions are made. That's how it was made for you and I. Like I went I was a I had the choice of military so I could go to college. So 
of, of the plethora of choices of working at a fast food restaurant, you know, be, just being a business owner and focusing on that. And I took military, okay, and moved on to the next stage. Once I got to the next stage, okay, I could go to a community college or go to uh, a state college or I could not go to college at all and just focus on business or maybe go to active duty military. So these are, these are the choices that are put in front of me, the choices that are put in front of you. These same choices aren't put in front of these guys. They don't, they don't, a lot of them have a record or they have substance abuse issues, so they don't get to join the military. They don't, they don't get to the, the easy out choices that they get. So it's a matter of putting choices in front of them that are feasible and can actually apply to them. Yeah. Apply to them. Man, well, it's, it's always nice to have choices. That's what it's all about. If, yeah. that's, if, that's, if we are really free, then life is just a bundle of choices. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for yeah. thank you for fighting for people's freedom. Thank you for caring. Well, you know, I think uh -huh. I think a lot of people care. I think a lot of people care. I just uh, there isn't like I said, there isn't an easy solution. You know, people care, and what can they do? Show support. Yeah. Well, that what you do what you can. Yeah. You this do is, what you this can. Is a big deal. And I, I hope it grows into uh, something better than we've seen in a long time. Yeah, yeah me too.